It's beautiful. Amen. Beautiful. If you have your Bible, turn with me tonight to the Gospel of John, chapter 11. John, chapter 11. Verse 35. Jesus wept. Father, bless this book now. This, this, this is your word, not mine. It's not the word of a man. It's the word of God. Help someone with it tonight. Comfort some soul. Speak to some heart. For whatever purpose that you intend, it will not return void. It will accomplish that which you please. In thy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. I want to talk to you tonight on a subject that, um, depending on what kind of a church you go to, some wear it out and others never mention it. And that's the humanity of Christ. And you've got to keep in mind that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ was a man. He's called the second man and he's called the last Adam. The reason he's called the second man is because all of mankind before Christ were considered in one group. And then the Lord Jesus Christ had no connection whatsoever with the first man. He's the second man. First man is of the earth earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. He's also called the last Adam. The word Adam is a word that uh, uh, the Lord God called uh, Adam, uh, which is, uh, literally means of the earth. And so he is the last Adam when he arose from the dead and by rising from the dead allowed all of spiritual humanity to come forth from him. And that was after his resurrection. He became the last Adam. The Bible says that we have been begotten to a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so his resurrection is a very important thing. The humanity of Christ is in verse number 35 of John chapter number 11. And it says he wept. Of course, you've heard it said many times that this is the shortest verse in the Bible, and it is, but it's one of the most profound. Two words, but it's profound. He did not weep for effect. In plain words, he was not following some kind of script that he was supposed to do thus and so at a certain time in a certain place. He wept because his heart was weeping. He wept because he loved Lazarus. And he wept because he had taken the place of mankind before God. There's going to be a new man. There's going to be a different man. There's going to be a perfect man. Unlike the first Adam who was not, Romans 5 tells you plainly what the first Adam did. But the Lord Jesus Christ wept. Now this weeping on the, on the, on the fact of Christ has to do with what's called experiential. In plainer words, he experienced it. He felt it. He felt in his heart and in his soul the loss that comes when you lose a loved one. Now, I don't know how many of you tonight have lost a loved one. Uh, a lot of times kids today, if they're so young, they've never lost anything. And oh, some great grandfather or some uncle, distant uncle or something that they've heard about. But there was no, per there was no personal loss involved. And when you have a personal loss like that, it makes you uh, begin to look at your life and to look at life. When you have a personal loss like that, it gives you an idea of uh, what's valuable and what we should be living for. And when you have a personal loss like that, it hurts. It hurts. It hurts. I was 10 years old when my grandfather, or it was my grandmother, looked at me and said, uh, she said, she simply read it from the newspaper. She said, Charles Lawson, Charles Arthur Lawson is dead. That, of course, is my father's name. His is Charles Arthur, mine is Charles William. And he died in 1956. I was 10 years old. And I'll never forget what I said to her. Of all the things of life, I said, she looked at me. She looked at me right in the eye. And of course, that was my father. And I looked back at her and I said, what do you want me to do, cry? You see, I spent the first 20-something years of my life building up rage, anger, anger. And when I went in the Marine Corps, it, in a lot of ways, it just fed the anger. I got madder, and I began to take that anger out anywhere I could because I wasn't raised up in a loving environment, a kind of environment that encourages you and establishes you and, and where you have a mother and a father there, too. Uh, and if you do have a mother and a father, you ought to thank God for that tonight. 
We're living in a nation where, where, where there's a lot of them that have no idea who their father is. The home has been destroyed. You destroy the home, the rest of it's going to go with it. The home is the foundation of a nation. The home is the foundation of civility. The home is absolutely the foundation of what we must have. Once we get back to the home and we get back to mothers and fathers with their children, you'll see a vast difference in the culture. But that's not going to happen until the Lord God begins to move on people. So I had no father, no mother like that. But in 1969, the grandfather that raised me, my grandfather, passed away. And I was sitting in the hospital room at UT Hospital when he passed away. I was in the room with him that night. And I'll never forget the nurse looking over at us and said, he has expired. And that's the first time I'd ever used that term, as, uh, heard it used as it related to death. Expired, but it's a good, accurate term because he has breathed out and will not breathe again. And I felt a loss that night. For the first time in my life, I felt a real loss because I loved my grandfather. And to this very day, I love my grandfather, William Riley Weaver. He was born in 1878. Jesse James was still robbing banks when my grandfather was born. I grew up in a household that reached all the way back into the 19th century. And so I was privileged in some ways to experience some things a lot of people don't experience. I knew what a wash tub was and a scrub, a scrub board. You ask a kid today what a wash tub is and a scrub board, they don't have any idea what you're talking about. I remember my grandmother washing clothes in a wash tub and I remember her, the scrub board and I also remember how wonderful it was the day we got a ringer washer. I thought, man, we have done something here now. I'll never forget that ringer washer. But you've got to be careful with it. Because you get caught in a ringer washer, you can be in trouble. Big time. <laughs> and that's probably one of the reasons it didn't last that long. But I felt the loss, folks. I felt the loss. Uh, I don't know of anything else in my life that ever, that ever uh, moved my soul like that did. And uh, when it did, it began, to, it began to speak to my heart. Because I realized I knew we were going to die one day, but it really didn't. This time it, uh, it registered in my soul because I hated to give up the only person on this earth that, that I knew really loved me was my grandfather. And I thank God for that. But it hurt. It hurt. It hurt. How many's ever been hurt like that? You ever been hurt? You ever, you ever been hurt? Now, I'm a pastor, a minister. I've been in the graveyard many, 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 many times. Preached many funerals down through the years. And I've been in situations where people just absolutely break down, you know, and I'm not critical. I'm not a bit critical. Uh, but I've been in cases also where people were stoic and they just kind of pass through it, you know, and keep a thick up, keep an upper lip, you know, and all that. And I've been through that too. But there's nothing wrong with crying. He did. He did. He wept. He had to feel humanity. This is him feeling something that God had never felt before. You say, I thought you said God knows everything. He knows everything, but he hadn't felt everything. But he did this time. God felt the loss in death. And so he wept. You know, BJ, we went over to the hospital Monday, and uh, he was still hooked up to a ventilator. And, uh, but the doctors had already told him, said there's nothing we can do for him because this... Uh, this aneurysm in his brain is, is just absolutely, it's, le it's deadly. That's why I was there when the doctor came in and said uh, he cannot survive this. And so his wife had to make a decision about unplugging him. And that's not an easy thing to do. It's not an easy thing to do. But uh, she didn't want to leave him in that condition from now on, so eventually they unplugged him. And when they did, he didn't last long. He didn't last long at all. So, you know, the doctor gave, a, gave a, the right diagnosis. It was keeping him alive, no question about it. And then he passed away. And sitting in the room there with him, his, there's his body, but he's gone. He's gone. He's not in that body anymore. Now, I've been in the room. I've been with people when they pass away more than once. I've been sitting right there, right next to them. I've been in the room when they passed away. I was there. I'm not talking about coming in later. I was there when it happened. And uh, something changes. There's just, there's just something that's different about it. The body's there, but you know there's, 
there's, there's, they're not there. They've gone. They've departed. In one sense, that's great comfort because you're not going to take him out here and bury him in the ground. See, there's nobody buried out here in the ground. The only thing is in that ground is the dust that came from that ground for it goes back to dust. It is this temporal earthly house of this tabernacle. But it's still the Lord Jesus had to feel it. Now, one of the reasons he had to feel it is because he's your high priest. And his feeling of what you endure on this earth allows him to minister to you the Holy Spirit. If you get home this afternoon, this evening, and read Romans 8, and you'll find out that by reading Romans chapter number 8, it talks more about the Spirit than any chapter in the Bible. It's from, from the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made us free from the law of sin and death. It starts out like that. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who will walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And then he goes on in the same chapter and he says, We know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Holy Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now that's some strong talk. But what he's trying to say to you is that the Holy Spirit is able to pick up and speak to God in where you have lost, you, you can't find the words for it. Truth of the matter is, there are things that happen to people in this life, there are no words for it. There are no words for it. No, no words in the English language. And the English language is the largest of all the languages by far and a way. We have more words in the English language than anything. No words, nobody even comes close. And the reason for that is because it's been developing. We're in the third phase of it. You had, you had uh, the old ancient e uh, English, then you had Middle English, and now you've got uh, Modern English. And it's been building through all these decades, adding these words from different languages. You'd be surprised every day how many words you use that are German or they're French or they're Spanish. And these words, and we just come accustomed, think they're English. No, they're not English. They come from a foreign language. But you see, even by saying all of that, there are some things that can happen to you that there's no word for it. There's no word for it. And for some people, when they experience a death, the loss of a loved one, there's really no words for it. No words. No words. That's not always the case. But I've seen the case. I've seen the situation where there's no words for it. The Bible says that we sorrow not as others that have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, them also in sleep in, which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. We sorrow. Yes, we sorrow. No question about it. And it's not wrong to sorrow. But we don't sorrow as others that have no hope. Because you see, a man can be an atheist and an agnostic and do as he pleases and live the kind of life he wants to live. But there's no comfort in atheism. And there's no comfort in agnosticism. No comfort in it whatsoever. None. None. No comfort. And when you come down to that moment, which we all must come down to, we all have to face it one way or another, one time or another. When you come down to that, the kind of life you lived is going to determine what you are at that place. You might have said you got saved when you were a six-year-old child on somebody's knee, but you've lived a godless life all of your life. Well, that's the way you'll stand at the graveyard, godless, godless. There'll be no comfort for you, and there's nothing that can comfort you. You've got a, you've got a heart that's broken and something inside of you that just empties you, and you just uh, you don't know what to do. You just have to turn it over to God. But I have seen cases where people lost their loved ones, and I have seen them weep, and then I've seen them laugh. I've seen them shout. I've seen them rejoice in the Lord because God at that moment gives them the power of the Holy Spirit to comfort them because that's what he's called. It's the parakletos is the Greek word. It simply means one who goes alongside of. In plain words, he's walking with you as you walk into the valley of sorrow. He's with you in the valley of sorrow, and he feels what you feel. Therefore, he's able to minister to you what you need. And he won't forsake you. He won't fail you. I've never seen him fail God's people. I've never seen it happen. He's never failed. He's always there when you need him. He'll never fail you. Aren't you glad for that? Yes. Father, I pray that you bless your word. Let the Holy Spirit come in here tonight. We need you. We need you, Lord. We need you. We need the Holy Spirit, God, speak to the hearts of people, move their soul, 
Give them enough grace to listen to what I have to say. If they don't have enough grace to listen to what I have to say, they need to take account with you and find out why. I pray for your presence. I pray for the Holy Spirit. This is a hard time, Lord. It's hard, and you know it is. And there's no way you can just sweep it under the rug and act like it didn't happen. You have to deal with it. This is what we have to go through in life. And I pray, Father, that tonight, if nothing else, that when we leave this place, that we'll know that we've been in the presence of the Lord. Father, I say as John the Baptist did, and I say it from all of my heart and all of my soul, I must decrease, but you must increase. I must decrease, and you must increase. Lord, I firmly believe tonight one of the things that has absolutely destroyed fundamentalism is preacher worship. Big name, celebrity preachers that people follow after just like the world. They have their heroes. Lord, hide me somewhere and get me out of the way so people can see the one that matters, the one that counts, the one that can help them. I can pray for them, Lord, but I can't lift their burdens. I can't do it. I can't even lift my own burdens. I pray for that. Heavenly Father, I know that this plague has taken a toll. I've seen churches on television that look like they're, they're just down to a handful of people. And at one time they had a, had a big crowd, but now they've come down to that. But Lord, I also believe this. I firmly believe this. I believe that when we go through trials and tribulations like the church is going through in this country, it can't help but do anything but make it better. It'll purge us. It'll cleanse us. It'll cause us to refocus who we are and what we're about. This place ought to be about the Lord Jesus. And Father, if this place is not about the Lord Jesus, I don't want any part of it. I want no part. For what time I have left in this world, and I don't know how much it is, Lord, but you see me. You know where I am. You see what, I'm, what I do. For what time I have left in this world, I want to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to lift him up. In his holy name I pray. Amen. So the spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience despises the word of God. And we tonight... If nothing else, if just one verse in the Bible ought to be the kind of, ought to, ought to be able to, you should be able to look into your heart and you should say to yourself, am I ready for that? Are you ready? Are you ready? You say, are you ready? I went to the emergency room. I've been to the emergency room, folks, seven, eight, nine, ten times since, not, since 2012 over and over and over and over and over to the ER with my heart running away, we call it tachycardia, just flying away, 140, 150, 160 beats a minute. And I've been there, and I've had them, they've, they've put, to, put me on a drip and so forth and to get my heart to slow down. It's, it's called atrial fibrillation. <clears throat> Last time I went to the emergency room, I went to St. Mary's Hospital. I went in there, my heart was flying away. Usually when you're a heart patient, they'll take you back quickly. They don't want you dropping out there on the floor. So they took me back, put me in a bed, and they, it, was in, it was in the emergency room. And I hadn't been there too long, and I felt everything begin to, I felt myself I beginning to lose. I knew I'd been through it before, but this time it was going. I could tell. I wasn't, I was between consciousness and unconsciousness in that room. And the next thing I knew, the doctor was flying through the door. He was running through the door. And the nurse was on one side and the doctor on the other. And the nurse put an IV in my arm and the doctor ran right up and looked at me in the eye. And they put a, they put a, uh, they put a temporary uh, a pacemaker in my heart that night. And then the next day they put me in ICU. And then they put a permanent pacemaker in my heart. But here's why I say all of that, because this is what's important. I had, nobody's ever had any greater peace than I had that night. 
I was at peace. Yeah, I was. I said, Lord, if this is it, if I'm leaving, okay. I'll hate to leave behind some that I love. But if this is it for me, I'm ready. Now, a wise man one time said that you'll never live until you know how to, ready to die. You'll never understand what life is about until you understand what it means if you gave it up. Death. And I suppose that that had a lot to do in forming the way I see things and believe in things was that, uh, was that episode in the emergency room. Now, since they've torn it down, God gave me a cardiologist that did a, an ablation and her name is Rashmi Hadaguder. She's a Hindu. She's got a spot right here in her forehead. God used that Hindu doctor to do an ablation on this Baptist preacher. And since she's done that, and it's been about three years ago now, four years, I forget how long it's been. I would just went to see her the other day. And she hooked, they can take a thing and lay it right here. And they can measure she just, it's a round thing. They lay it right here where this pacemaker is located, and they can tell me, she can look at a paper and say, see, every heartbeat in the last three months or the four months or five months, every single heartbeat. And the last time I went in there, she laid that thing on my chest, and she printed it out, and she looked at it, and she looked at me, and she says, you haven't had one, not one, skip or one, uh, a beat that wasn't right your heart has beat perfectly for the last uh, two years or so two years yeah remember now God used a doctor to do that but the greatest thing to me is not that the greatest thing to me is in the bed at Fort Saint, at St. Mary's Hospital when I knew I was losing it and I was ready to go and you don't have to believe me you don't have to believe me. How many of you have ever been in a place where you thought you might be dying? See? All right. Then you learn something about yourself. You have to experience it. You have to go through it. You can't, you, you can tell other people all, you, you can tell you're blue in the face, but they'll never understand it until they go through it. And you look at, in your heart and in your soul, you are facing the real possibility that you'll never walk out of that building again. So how did you react? How'd you get to it? How'd you do with it? That's a blessing. That's something, something that nobody can take away from you. Because I'll tell you right now, some people when they go through that, they are scared to death. They are trembling, shaking, screaming, and they're worried to death. Why? Because they're going to cross over to the other side and it's got them. Now, I can preach till I'm blue in the face to you tonight, but I gave you a message from my heart and from my soul about who I am. And I've made it plain in, the, in my prayer closet with God more than once. Lord, I'm here till you get ready to take me. And if when you get ready to take me, I'm ready to go. I don't, I don't, I'm not in a big hurry to leave. That's just natural. But if God calls me home, I'm going home. I firmly believe when BJ got up Monday morning, I firmly believe that he knew something was happening. His wife said he couldn't speak to her after that. He knew something was happening. But there was never any fear. There was never any of that. And his time came this past Monday. And BJ was carried out of here into the presence of the Lord, and he's left his old body with us. That's the bottom line. B.J.'s gone. I love B.J. I'm going to tell you one of the reasons I love him. He was a humble man. I don't know if you noticed it or not, but I used to call on him all the time to pray. You ever notice? How many, how many called on to that? <laughs> Observant. Well, the reason I did is because I loved his spirit. I loved his spirit. That I'm drawn to humility, and I'm repelled by pride. And so I'll miss him. I'll miss him till we see him again. Goodbye, BJ. <laughs> Goodbye. All right, I'm done. Father, bless your word. Bless your word. Bless Berna. 
Lord, I know, no doubt in my mind, she's, she's in a hard place right now. Bless Berna. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you for listening.